Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's the third day of Eurotier. Quite an impressive show, isn't it? But as you all will witness now, there's more to it than just machines and innov innovation. It's all about knowledge. Uh, so welcome to the Pulsi World Seminar on Gut Health. I am Fabian Brockter, for who you don't know, and as the editor of Pulsi World, uh, I will guide you through today's program. Uh, if you look around here in the room, there are a couple of uh, cameras set up, uh, as this is a hybrid seminar, which is uh, streamed on YouTube as well. So when you want, you can wave at the camera and wave for a few seconds at your colleagues who are unfortunately not here. But all kidding aside, I'm glad to have you all here in this seminar, both physically and online. And the main theme of today, of course, is good health. I have a lineup of four speakers uh, for you who will share their knowledge on this interesting subject. And they will touch upon the many uh, aspects of ensuring a healthy gut, which is, as you all know, uh, crucial uh, to a healthy birth and a profitable poultry operation. That, ladies, brings me, ladies and gentlemen, of course, sorry, brings me to the first speaker of today. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Ellen van Eeren. And Ellen is researcher poultry nutrition at Schothorst Feed Research. In her presentation of today, uh, Ellen will share uh, the finesses and differences in gut health in conventional and slow-growing broiler breeds. And she will focus on the interactions between genetics and the immune system and cover the consequences for nutritional strategies. So Ellen, good to have you here. Here's your first slide, and the audience is yours. Thank you, Fabian, for the introduction. Oh, good morning, everybody, people in the room and uh, people online. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, gut health in conventional and slow-growing broiler breeds. And it's no surprise that the bird as we know it today uh, has been subject of uh, um, many, many years of uh, genetic selection, which has led to a very different uh, chicken. Uh, for example, if you compare a laying hen and a broiler, they were selected for different uh, production traits, uh, but not only within the species itself there has been s genetic selection, also within uh, each breed there has been selection for uh, increased uh, production levels. This is a very well known picture uh, from uh, Zuidhof indicating that the bird over the last 50 years um, has uh, is uh, four times as heavy as it was compared to 1957. And also in laying hens you see that the modern uh, laying hen is able to produce more than two, th uh, two times as many eggs as it was 50 years ago. So, but with each selection process, um, there's also selection for other traits and sometimes unintended and sometimes undesirable um, uh, selection for certain traits. For example, uh, nutritional demands of the immune system may have been affected by this continuous uh, selection for higher production levels. So you can ask yourself what happened with the immune system during this continuous uh, genetic selection for higher production. And keeping that in mind, uh, you have to uh, realize that most of the research done on, uh, for example, the efficacy of certain feed additives was done in fast-growing breeds, fast-growing broiler breeds. So uh, the basis for this presentation is the question, do feed additives have the same effect in conventional broiler breeds compared to slow-growing broiler breeds? If you look at uh, the figures that were collected uh, from the antibiotic use in the Netherlands, you can see that the slow-growing broiler breeds uh, need uh, significantly uh, less antibiotics compared to the conventional broiler breeds. Now, I indicated the, um, the digestion part uh, just as a reference, uh, it goes for all uh, reasons that are mentioned here, but also for digestion. It's shown that slow-growing broiler breeds need less antibiotics compared to uh, fast-growing bre uh, broiler breeds. Um, so uh, that raises the question, uh, does growth rate interact with the immune system? So before we dig deeper into that, I would like to show a little bit of immunology. Um, 
you can divide the immune system um, on multiple ways. You can compare uh, innate versus uh, adaptive. Uh, you can um, uh, di divide it into specific and aspecific. Um, but I want to indicate the difference between cellular and humoral immunity. So this is an example of uh, what happens in humoral immunity. It's more or less the antibody response. So after the first exposure to an antigen, you see an increase of uh, IgM. This is an immunoglobulin of the N type, which increases, and after a certain period of time, also the immunoglobulin of the type G increases. Uh, but they decrease again after the exposure of the, uh, to the antigen um, has stopped. But when there's a second exposure to the same antigen, you can see that the immune system is able to respond very quickly because of the memory. This is completely different in a cellular response, which is more or less the pro-inflammatory response. This is um, shown here. Uh, macrophages, they produce cytokines. These cytokines are uh, signaling molecules and they um, uh, bring the animal into a pro-inflammatory state which can lead to, for example, uh, pain, uh, anorexia, so reduced feed intake, uh, but also fever. Um, and it also induces an acute phase response, which means that um, acute phase proteins have to be produced by the liver, which is at the expense of um, protein deposition as muscle tissue. So there's a very distinct difference between a humoral and a cellular response. So this was um, uh, the subject of my former colleague, uh, Christina Simon, when she did her PhD at Wageningen University. She did research where she compared a laying hen and a broiler, a fast-growing broiler breed. And it's uh, almost, uh, yeah, um, yeah you can see the tremendous difference uh, after seven weeks of age. Um, she used the uh, laying hen and the and the broiler, uh, so uh, f in fact a pullet, so a, a young, a young laying hen, and she compared it to a broiler, and she used um, a model, an intestinal model, to induce inflammation, and she used uh, DSS uh, to increase uh, to induce um, uh, yeah, an intestinal challenge, uh, only for a very short period of time, and after she stopped. DSS administration, the birds were challenged at day 35 with LPS. And what you saw in the pullets is was that they had more intestinal damage, they produced more of the pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin beta, one interleukin 1 beta, and she also found a uh, much higher mortality in the pullets. Uh, whereas the broilers, um, they uh, produced, uh, they had a higher uh, mRNA expression of Ig. Uh, immunoglobulins uh, in the ileum. She repeated a, a, a similar comparison between these two types of birds with an early feeding model. So, so she had early feeding versus delayed feeding. And what she saw was that the, um, the, broiler, that the broilers produced much more IgA than the pullets. But the pullets, on the other hand, they produce, produced again much more of the pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin 1 beta. So in short, broilers have a higher gene expression for antibody production, whereas pullets have a, a higher uh, gene expression for the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this indicates that there are different immune strategies between broilers and laying hens. Broilers respond more as a humoral type immune response, whereas pullets or laying hands respond more like a pro-inflammatory type of uh, immune response. This raises an interesting question because um, uh, what does this mean uh, um, if you apply immunomodulation through feed? Um, it could very well be that you need different approaches knowing that these two immune strategies are really different between different types of animals. So. Um, Therefore, um, I wanted to know, okay, um, uh, the slow-growing broiler breeds gain more and more interest in the poultry industry, so how they do they relate to the fast-growing broiler compared to a laying hen? 
is it more like a humoral type of response or is it more like a pro-inflammatory type of response or is it, or is it somewhere in between? Um, we know that genetic selection for high growth uh, affects cell-mediated immunity and we also know that, for example, uh, the resistance to coccidiosis is also through cell-mediated immunity. So this um, it has been published before in literature where uh, they have hypothesized that perhaps a slow-growing broiler breed would be more resistant to coccidiosis compared to a fast-growing broiler. Um, well, they compared uh, a Ross versus a Ranger classic bird. They applied an Emeria Maxima challenge, um, but they only found a significant interaction on crypt depth in the jejunum. This is in itself a relevant uh, observation because coccidiosis also affects the crypts. Um, but they found similar gene copy numbers um, in both breeds, which indicates or they concluded that both breeds did not differ in their resistance or tolerance to coccidiosis. Uh, other another research group used uh, the same uh, comparison between the fast-growing and slow-growing breed, uh, the, the, the Ross versus the Ranger Classic, but these researchers dug m deeper into the, um, the immune system and they found that the, uh, the slow-growing breed, the Ranger Classic, um, had a higher uh, upregulation of genes that were involved in, um, in inflammatory responses. So this COX-1 and COX-2, uh, they are enzymes, cyclooxygenase, and they are deeply involved in pro-inflammatory responses. So again, they found that uh, slow-growing broiler breeds had a more pro-inflammatory mode of uh, 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 type of immune system. These are data collected by um, Animal Health Service in the Netherlands, um, where they uh, indicated uh, they, ha they monitor on a national basis, um, uh, for example, um, uh, the clinical symptoms of certain uh, intestinal diseases. And they found that, um, that coccidiosis was much more prevalent in the, in the uh, slow-growing broiler breeds. This was not the case for necrotic enteritis, there it was the opposite, but typically coccidiosis which was much more prevalent in the slow-growing breeds. And also they found that coccidiosis in the slow-growing breeds was accompanied by clinical disease. So um, taking this all together, uh, we've done a, um, a pilot study at Schotter's Feed Research where we compared three slow-growing broiler breeds and we compared it to a, a, a Ross breed. And we took some blood samples on day 37 and these birds were not challenged at all. They were kept under normal uh, um, uh, management conditions, but the cells that we took out, the, the white blood cells, they were exposed to LPS. So this is an ex vivo challenge. And we saw that the slow-growing broiler breeds tended to have a higher production of nitric oxide, and also nitric oxide is an indicator of a pro-inflammatory response. We didn't find a significant difference, but we found the same trend as what we saw before uh, in literature. So the slow-growing broiler breeds had, again, a higher uh, pro-inflammatory type of immune response. So the conclusion uh, on that part is that uh, the slow-growing broiler breeds tend to uh, respond more in a pro-inflammatory way, so they, if they seem to have shifted towards a laying hen, but of we don't know at this point um, um, to what extent. I mean, um, you could not say that a slow-growing broiler should be compared to a pullet. That's not the case. Um, and you could also ask, is this genetically determined or, or is it just an adaptive response? So this could have consequences for feed additives that claim to have an immunomodulation modula uh, activity. Uh, for example, beta-glucans. Uh, they uh, activate macrophages, so they more or less stimulate a pro-inflammatory response. And it could very well be that uh, this, this effect could, be, uh, could work out differently in slow-growing or fast-growing broilers. And there's also a difference in the 
the, the, the period, it does show a long term, long term exposure to beta glucans. What you can see here is that the, um, the white bars, they indicate um, uh, body weight gain uh, under non-challenged conditions. And you can see that with a long-term exposure or even a short-term exposure to beta glucans, there was a significant reduced body weight gain. But when the birds were challenged, if you uh, compare the black uh, bars, you can see that there's definitely uh, some benefit uh, in uh, supplying beta glucans in challenged uh, birds, uh, although you should not challenge them too long. So beta glucans had some benefits under challenging conditions. And you have to keep in mind that uh, upregulation of the immune system is energetically costly, and particularly a pro-inflammatory response is very energetically costly. So we had a trial, a necrotic enteritis trial at Schotthorst, where we compared uh, a low and a high dose of a hydrolyzed yeast, also with beta glucans as an active component. And we saw in the period where the birds were not infected um, that the, the high dose level of this yeast led to significantly lower body weight gain and feed intake. But when the birds were challenged with necrotic enteritis, we saw um, a significant improvement in uh, both body weight gain, but also in the severity of the clostridium lesions. So this indicates that uh, the effects of the hydrolyzed yeast, um, uh, yeah, they had some uh, an energetically costly uh, uh, response, but under challenging conditions, they may support uh, performance of the bird. However, in conventional breeds. So the take-home messages uh, for me to you today are um, be aware that there are different immune str strategies and that pullers respond more and laying hands respond more in a pro-inflammatory way, whereas broilers respond more in a humoral um, uh, way. And that slow-growing breeds respond more pro-inflammatory than uh, fast-growing breeds, but probably not to the same extent as laying hands. Um, but keep in mind that this may affect the efficacy of certain feed additives, especially the ones that uh, claim immu immunomodulating activity, So, which is probably worth digging deeper into. So I would like to acknowledge my colleague Regiana Santos, who was involved in this research, and also Aert Lammers and uh, Joop Aarts from the Adaptation Physiology Group at Wageningen University. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Really interesting research indeed. Um, maybe there are some questions. Who can I, may I invite to uh, ask the first question of today? It wasn't that clear, was it? It's I'm novel so research. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I have a no. question about, uh, it's, it's more a uh, clarifying question. Uh, you said that there was uh, a lot of coccidiosis uh, found in the slower growing uh, uh, broilers. Uh, was there any coccidials used of vaccination in this in this trial? Uh, which trial are you referring to? Uh, the the one which you said that there was a, a higher coccidiosis uh, and disease, uh, also a, a physical disease. In uh, ah, you oh, that's uh, the monitoring uh, from the uh, animal health service in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, no. I assume there has been some anti-coccidial strategy. I can. Uh, I hardly believe that there has not been any kind of anti-coccidial strategy. Excellent. So uh, this, this was not an experiment. Uh -oh. This was a monitoring uh, from what they, what they get from the field in the, in the whole year. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um, another question, Ed. Um, you said the slow slow, uh, uh, with the slow growers, we should maybe re-evaluate uh, uh, the additives we, we use, which would be the the main additives on top of your re-evaluation list? Um, I think uh, especially feed additives that uh, claim to have an effect on the immune system, they could, um, they would be, uh, it would be interesting to test them as well in slow growing breeds and uh, with fast growing breeds at the same time to see if, they're, if they have the same efficacy in slow growing breeds. And it can work both ways. So the ones that uh, claim to um, have an uh, immunomodulating effect, so um, perhaps increasing more a pro-inflammatory response. 
um, it could very well be that in slow growing breeds they are not as effective as in fast growing breeds. But on the other hand, there are also additives that claim an anti inflammatory activity and they could perhaps be more effective in slow growing breeds than in fast growing breeds. So there are multiple uh, interactions uh, um, um, possible and it would be good to, to, uh, to evaluate those additives. Interesting to look into indeed. Yeah. Uh, question from the audience here? W w one moment for the microphone. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is that you said that uh, using beta glucans might compromise performance in case we don't have E. coli uh, challenge. So practically it is hard to define because when we are using feed we are preparing this in prior. So how it comes to identify when to use it and when not to use it? This is the first question, please. Uh, the second question, I don't know if you tackled this before. Uh, uh, in fast growing uh, breeds, we are noticing in most of the cases, when we have coccidiosis, we will have this bacteriosis, especially when we are seeing the maxima lesion. So what is your explanation for that? Thank you. Um, to get to your second question first, so you, uh, just uh, for a clarification for me, you say that uh, when you find Ameria maxima, you also find this bacteriosis? Yes, yes. It's very, very related. There is some, some correlation. Uh, yes, that's... Uh, uh, that's also that y I mean um, um, yeah that's uh, that's that's very clear that this will happen because the whole the whole uh, microbiome will be will be challenged in those cases um, the 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 data that I showed they were from uh, from a monitoring in the whole in the Netherlands so they monitor on different uh, um, indicated farms uh, the level of uh, coccidiosis uh, and also necrotic enteritis. They also mentioned dysbacteriosis. Uh, dis the dysbacteriosis, if we can we go back or is it all time? Um, with dysbacteriosis, you uh, could see that um, they were almost equal in both slow and fast growing birds. So it's the one on the top. It says dysbacteriosis. It's almost in equal proportions in both the fast and slow growing birds. But uh, surprisingly, they found much more necrotic enteritis in the fast growing birds, but more coccidiosis in the slow growing birds. Um, this is just a monitoring. It doesn't give a uh, causal explanation. Um, but for me, it's interesting to see that um, um, we tend to believe that slow-growing birds, they, are, uh, they have better welfare, they are more healthy. Well, that may not always be the case, and especially for coccidiosis. And I don't have an explanation right now why they found more coccidiosis in slow-growing birds and more necrotic enteritis in fast-growing birds. And I didn't mention anything on the microbiome in this presentation, but it could very well be that also the microbiome um, um, was taken as a correlated response in genetic selection and that also the, the, the composition of the microbiome plays an important role here. That was the second question. Uh, what was your first question? Yes. <laughs> yeah, the question was um, if, uh, if you say that uh, beta-glucans compromise performance and in non-challenged birds, but they can have a positive effect in challenged birds. How do you know upfront uh, which situation the birds will encounter and if you should use it? Well, that's the million dollar question, I think. Um, um, when we do experiments uh, with uh, additives that claim a certain effect on the immune system, we typically use some, so some sort of challenging conditions because that's the... the, the that's the situation where you expect the most of a certain additive. And I agree that uh, in the field then there may be high performing uh, farms that do not need that kind of additives. But there are also plenty of other farms that can uh, benefit from certain supports. And not only beta glucans, but also other feed additives. Thank you for, for uh, clarifying and explaining, Alan. Um, 
you'll probably be here around for, for more questions, but for the uh, sake of time, I wanted to, to move on. Okay. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, a round of applause for Ellen van Eeren. Thank you. <laughs> ah, the slides are moving by itself. It's really good. Um, so I wanted to co continue with the next speaker of today, which is uh, Leon Marchand. He's Innovations Director at Din Danisco Animal Nutrition and Health, and in his role, I know him, or I know you, <laughs> uh, as always being on the forefront with new ideas and thoughts. Um, in your presentation, uh, you were, uh, with, uh, which will revolve around alternative ingredients, hot topic at this moment, uh, you will answer the question, how additives can help to push the boundaries of broiler feed formulation? So please go ahead. Thank you, Fabian, for the nice words. Indeed, in the next 15 minutes, I want to talk to you about how the additives can help to push the boundaries of feed formulation. But the first question is, what about talking about feed formulation on the health gut health symposium? We have to remember that nutrition, the microbiome, and gut and immune function are highly intertwined, which we often describe in the nutribiosis concept, but they can go either in a very positive way or in a negative way, but they interact with each other. They're not silos. The microbiome, the nutrition, and the gut and immune function are not silos, but interly connected. Why also look at new strategies? I think everybody's aware that prices have gone to the roof, both on commodities, eh, feedstock commodities, but also, for example, on phosphate rock, MCB prices really increased. Also, what we need to work on is better environmental footprint. Our sector is under pressure, everybody knows that, and we still have to keep working on reducing antibiotic use. And we have to think about responsible sourcing, where our raw material is coming from. So if you think about that, in the end, we need to start using different ingredients. But they have to be available, they have to have the right nutritional value, and they come with some limitations. If not, we have used them already before, of course. So you can think about different ways of feed processing, new formulation approaches, but in this talk I will zoom in on use of additives, if how they can help in this. If I think about what are the challenges of alternative ingredients, most of it is that they come with a higher phytate and especially higher fiber content. Some of these ingredients also have a higher variability, not all, but some will be more variable in the composition, and that all leads to the reduced uh, uh, digestibility, especially amino acid digestibility is lower, but also some other nutrients. If you think about the gut health, then it's really that you see that due to these higher levels and some of all anti-nutritional factors, the gut health is typically more challenged. Adding this all up will really lead to a reduce in performance. So typically, if you swap your alternative ingredients in one-on-one, -on -one, especially at higher levels, you will suffer performance. One of the elements, for example, that especially is different is the NSP content, so the, the non-starch polysaccharides, so all of the fibers. If you have the classical components like corn, wheat, or soybean meal, they typically are actually low in NSP content, while the alternatives, whether it's the brands like wheat and rice bran, or canola, a rapeseed meal, uh, or a sunflower meal, or DDGS, will be much higher. So if you think about how could we help to improve the performance of the bird, we both can think of actionist enzymes, that are enzymes the animal does not have, phytase for example, or enzymes enzymes that the animal already has, but maybe a young bird will really help with an additional amount of protease to better digest. So if you think about this, uh, you want to increase the mineral energy and amino acid absorption, you want to improve nutrient utilization, in the end, you, it's all leading to more balanced microbiome, of course, to improve the gut performance. Another element to consider is the probiotic, and that's both uh, in a way from, uh, let in the past, a lot of people looked at the immune function, which is still is important, but another element to look at is what a kind of enzymes can these microbes express. Plotted here is the, uh, all of the genes, this the three strains in vivo pro probiotic can express, and of particular interest is there's quite some genes capable of expressing that can help to degradate a wide variety of complex carbohydrates. And of course, that will help to liberate nutrients for the host, but also work to a very much more stable gut. So if we add this all up and we think about what are should be our strategies, 
to mitigate the negative effects of alternative ingredients, you really see that increased fiber content, of course, NSP enzymes can help a lot. A protease can help on the amino acids, but also to reduce the amount of potential fermentable protein. A phytase is really the basis nowadays, and a, a, a high phytase dose throughout will really help in a lot of different elements on a better performance. And of course, a probiotic, it's more on the gut health and on dealing with the fiber content. So that brings us to the research question. Eh? Can the use of enzymes and probiotic really facilitate using higher use of alternative ingredients uh, without compromising performance? And I'm going to discuss two examples of that. And both of them is really pushing the boundaries. One is we did work, and really published also extensively on that, on total inorganic phosphate-free in male fast-growing broilers from day one. And the other element is where we presented uh, at uh, PSA in San Antonio uh, last July is totally soy-free diets from day one in male broilers. Let's first talk about soy. Soy is actually a very nice ingredient. Eh? High amino acid digestibility, low fiber content. Why would you look at replacing it at all? There are several trends for that. One is there's a tendency, and especially in Europe, to reduce transport costs and to reduce CO2, and especially CO2 compared to land use and land use change. And as you know, if you source your soy from Latin America, it still comes with a significant LULUC value. There's a small but growing segment in Northwest Europe that really wants to go totally soy free. And for any people in formulation using more alternative ingredients in most of the market in Europe in ASPAC is uh, more alternative ingredients is economic to use. And so it's also for us a really good model to push the boundaries eh? because if you totally go soy free, you put it to the extreme and then you can see how your birds react and the additives react. When we looked at literature, we saw that partial replacement of soybean meal was successful, but that total replacement was either much more expensive or the bird suffered performance-wise. So that brought to us a research question, could we do, eh, could we organize it that we don't suffer that much performance-wise and it's economically close or equivalent? For this, we did the following experiment. It's a 2.4 plus 1 setup. As a control, we had uh, soybean meal, and then with phytase and xylanides in it, so a very commercial uh, diet. And they have two different strategies. One strategy was following the breeders' uh, objectives also on crude protein and typical diet, and then with different uh, alternative ingredients to match it all. And, and, and the other one was a reduced crude protein diet strategy. On average, 1.5 to 2% lower crude protein. Of course, all the amino acid requirements stayed the same, so um, uh, live on different diet with um, different elements in it. If, yes, oh yeah. Just an example, and this is then the grower diet on it. Uh, we used a variety of different raw materials. Some of them might be quite familiar, like sunflower and rapeseed meal. Others, for example, like cottonseed meal or some pea protein, uh, are less common. But we, we used a whole mix of different ingredients instead of one or two to replace soy because we wanted to look at the effect of the different additives. Due to time, I will only show here the best performing. And our best performer was a combination of a probiotic, phytase, silanase, beta-glucanase. Um, um, and this all was, in the end, very close to breeders' objectives and really uh, performing well, both on body weight gain as on FCR. But the nice point actually was that it was economic equivalent already to our best treatment compared to the conventional soy diet. And that was with 2021 prices. Also, we looked at carbon footprint. And for this, we used Feedprint from Wagen University and then the 2020 database version, the latest version. And what you can see is that reducing the soy, and uh, we fully took out the soy here, it comes with a much lower carbon footprint. And this is done for standard Dutch conditions. And that means for Europe, typically we source our soy from Latin America. and it comes with quite some carbon footprint. So, if I conclude the part on the soybean meal-free diets, we saw that reducing crude protein diet requirements compared to breeders' objectives, so that also means higher synthetic amino acid and a wide variety of different raw materials, was really the best strategy. The combination of xylanase, beta-glucanase, a protease, on top of phytase, um, really performed well together with uh, the probiotic combination. And we 
and our conclusion is that higher levels of alternative ingredients is possible as long as also you think about how to mitigate these negative effects of these alternative ingredients. Switching to the other topic where we push the boundaries, that's inorganic phosphate free. In essence, organic phosphate works, eh? inorganic phosphate works, so why would you want to replace it? I think we have to remember it's a mined finite resources, so we will run out of it. Also, it comes from geopolitical sensitive areas, and I think we have all encountered what that meant in the last year. All everything you put in that's not truly needed, of course, also ends up in the end in the manure. So we can use it to reduce phosphorus emissions. We can, and you have to remember that also a ton of MCP is around 750 kilogram of CO2. So I uh, if you reduce, you also reduce the carbon of your feet. And I already we talk about cost. It's a cost in your feet. You for part at least can do without. But if you're going to look at formulating inorganic phosphate free, you really see there are some challenges, especially in the beginning. And that's also why doing it from day one is a nice model to push the boundaries. Because later on, the requirements on phosphate are of course lower, but especially in the beginning, a phytase has to really release a lot of phosphorus. Typically you have 0.15% uh, phosphorus in the basal diet available, but the rest then has to be liberated from phytate. So if we talk about a strategy, what are important elements? Of course you need to start with a very highly effective phytase that's able to liberate very quickly and very to a high extent the phosphor that's caught up in the phytate. If you totally take out inorganic phosphate, you have also to be mindful that you have enough phosphorus available in total. It, eh, the bird needs his phosphor. Also, we considered a phase-specific dosing strategy. That means we started high with two or 3,000 FTUs and then went down when the bird was older. And of course, we looked at our calcium levels, which is also very important always to do, and we stimulated good gizzard development. This is where we have done quite some work on, and there's already nine data set from six independent trials. And also I want to point out two of these trials really we pushed the boundaries because we uh, only went to a simple corn soy diet. And if you look at the fight at levels in the simple corn soy diet, you're really pushing the boundaries. What we saw, if you looked across these trials in the meta-analysis, that there was no negative impact on body weight or on FCR, if all that was better in the IP3 versions. So we really were able to do that without loss of any performance. And also when we look at tibia ash or bone breaking strength, these are the two parameters to look on the bone mineralization. For both of them, they were either equivalent or actually at day 42, so if you take them to an older age, it was actually beneficial, the IP3 strategy. So. With all this, this work, and as I mentioned, quite some of this work has been scientifically published and presented before, we really are encouraging the people, our customers, to reduce in the amount of inorganic phosphate being used. But a lot of people typically, eh, for example, this example, if you have a thousand FDUs of phytate, and uh, what we typically see is that then you will see that these are the levels of MCP typical still being used. Some people might use more, some people might use yes, but this is a typical average of MCP use. If you take away that average, of course eh, the bird eats less of the starter feed and more of the finisher feed, but if you take away that average, you will see around uh, 2.3 kilogram of MCP use per ton of feed in total. With 2000 eh, last month's prices, that's around 3 euros almost. You put in your feed on MCP. So that's quite a lot of money on the table. And even if you only reduce it partially, it's beneficial for economy, but also for uh, emissions. So if you summarize that and on the IP3 work, we always say be mindful that you have sufficient phytate available, especially in the starter feed. Later on, it's less critical, but the starter feed is more critical. Step rise replacement is important. The enzyme dose, you have to start high and then lower. And in the end, it's good for economy and sustainability. If I want to zoom out in the end and make the connection between the two, then you really see that if we talk about pushing the boundaries, that the connection between both IP free and soy free is that you start to think different on your raw materials. So here I listed all the raw materials we used 
in the borders from day one, so early on. And you can clearly see that some of these materials people recognize as being in a boiler diet, others are not. Some of these materials are actually maybe ruminant materials, but in combination and then with the right additives, they really can help you to formulate different. And yes, that will challenge also the bird, but this is again where then the right uh, additive strategy from enzymes and probiotics can help to navigate that. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention and the floor is open for discussion. Thank you so much, Leon. Really interesting work. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was wondering, uh, yeah. when you talk to a nutritionist or a feed mill yeah. on pushing the boundaries like so much as you presented, mm. how is their response? Because they are not the big risk takers, mm. in my opinion. No, no, no offense. No, no, no offense. <laughs> it's, it's quite recognizable. I've said also at the other side of the table, so if you have a million ton of feed or millions of birds, you have to take things step by step. And this is also why we want to push the boundaries, because in an academic environment, typically, there's already it's a relatively safe environment. So the first thing the, the, the nutritionist does is translate something in a safe environment to his or her environment. And this is also why it's good to push the boundaries, then you show what's really possible, and it will take a safety margin on that. Mm. But that's fine. So it's this at least gets you the attention. If you have the conversation with the, the nutritionist, he or she is very interested in, oh, that's interesting work, mm -hmm. and then it will take a step, and the step is then to reduce, not to fully eliminate, but at least it gets people moving in that direction. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really triggering. Uh, any questions from the audience? It's a real quiet audience today. But <laughs> um, I have a, another question uh, for you, uh, and it, it, it's about trying to figure out my own handwriting here. Um, <laughs> when you go to, to a soy-free formulation, uh, what uh, would be the, the main elements to consider there? Yeah, if you really, yeah, I think you have to distinguish between soy-free and reducing soy, but the main thing you have to look at then is to use enough raw materials. I think it's an illusion to eliminate soy and just put one ingredient in. Even if it's good, it's not good. You, you have to look at all the amino acids so we formulated up to 10 amino acids we take a look at, and there are eight, let's say, synthetic amino acids commercially available. So you have to look at the whole pattern and really keep a close eye on the total amino acid balance. That's one thing. The other thing is that reducing compared to breeders' uh, objective, you could protein, is more effective. And I think one of the elements is that it also lowers a bit the burden of some of the alternative ingredients with fiber content, for example, mm -hmm. of all the others. Another element in, in it is, and you can play actually that the more positive way, if you take out soy, your potassium level goes down, which is of course is good for uh, the, uh, your, your um, the quality of the litter. Mm -hmm. In this trial, we wanted to keep that out, so we uh, added actually potassium uh, carbonate to keep it leveling, but you can reduce that. But you have to keep an eye also on the decat value, that it doesn't drop too low, so then sodium, potassium, the, I think these are the key elements, amino acids, your, your balances on uh, potassium and uh, sodium. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then make sure, of course, if you really push the boundaries, that the nutritional value, if it's variable, that you know that. Yeah, yeah. And, and in, this, in, this, in this work you, you did, um, w did you see, uh, see an effect on gut health and, and micro microbial population as well? in going soy-free on inorganic phosphate feed? Yeah, I think there also we have to distinguish. Uh, the IP-free work is pushing the boundaries, but not to extend on the composition. The macro composition is more making use of what's actually already there and really pushing it with, with a higher phytase. Mm -hmm. Those With the soy-free, uh, what you see is that a, a little bit of additional fiber is actually beneficial when you shift more to the, uh, the, the, the butyrate-forming bacteria. If you push it too far, of course, the birds get into problems. So uh, what you need to, s to balance there is the amount of fiber load will go up. And typically, we have been feeding broilers low fiber levels. A little bit of additional fiber is actually beneficial. If you also help the bird uh, mitigate that, if you push too far, then to uh, this is the first proof of concept study. And mm. we are planning some follow-up work. But that's our findings until now. All right. I yeah. will stay on top of that. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, a round of applause yeah. for, for Leon, yeah. and when there's any questions afterwards, he will still be available. Right. Ah, this works.
ultimately, with pleasure, I want to introduce uh, the next speaker of today, which is uh, Dr. Alain Rigi, and he is a global uh, poultry manager at Vileo. Welcome, uh, Alain. Uh, the presentation of today, it's already on the screen, is breaking the vicious circle of intritus and re the return of homeostasis to the bird's gut. And as I understand it, it's all about tight junctions and epithelial integrity, yes. but I gladly hand over uh, the word to the expert. Okay. Thank you. So hello everyone, so hello also on the person who are online. Uh, so today the main topic is gut health. So you know gut health is a question of equilibrium and it's very important to keep this equilibrium in modern poultry farming. It has been very well explained by Ellen in the first presentation in conventional broiler, uh, they have been selected upon their capacity to eat, upon their capacity to grow, of course, and this has an impact on the, on the gut uh, status because it will maintain a sort of chronic gut inflammation. And the problem will be, of course, that we, we can have, if there are stress, we can have more metabolic disease and we can have also the development of opportunistic bacteria. So what's happening during this vis vicious cycle of the bacterial enteritis? We have an oversupply of the feed, and then there are some opportunistic bacteria, like the clostridium, which can profit by this oversupply of nutrients, and they will grow, they will eat the mucus, because they are muc mucolytic, and they can release some toxins, and this will maintain the local inflammation. And at the end, we have a modification of the morphology of the gut, and also, uh, an alteration of the functionality of the gut. And at the end, of course, the main result will be a lower uh, absorption of the nutrient. And lower absorption of the nutrient means that this nutrient will be more available for the bacteria which are in the gut. So it's a sort of vicious cycle with development. So this bacteria is at the beginning, but at the end it can uh, arrive at the level of the necrotic contritis with mortality. So it's why, it's why it's quite important to stop the evolution of this vicious cycle. So, and how can we stop it, uh, or can, how can we prevent it? Of course, the basic, the must-have, I will not explain it, it's a good farm management, it's a good vaccination program, it's a good feed quality, it's the basics, of course. But we can help also the birds by uh, strengthening the epithelial barrier of the gut by modulating the microbiota with a good balance of this microbiota and also by uh, preventing the development of pathogenic bacteria. We can also help the birds to reduce the effect of the oxidative stress and also uh, we can help the, to have a better functioning of the immune system. And for that we have three solutions which can help the birds uh, to prevent from the development of this, um, this uh, vicious cycle to return to a good homeostasis in the gut. So let's speak first about the epithelial barrier strengthening. strengthening. So Safmanan is a yeast fraction, what we call a postbiotic. The main components are beta-glucans and alpha-manans. And these components are very efficacious, uh, for instance, to have, to keep a good gut integrity. In this trial, which has been published in 2020, the birds were fed with a feed containing safmanan. And uh, what we saw uh, at 21 days and at 42 days, the, the, the gut dead cell density, the number of the cells which are present on the gut epithelium, was significantly higher in the safmanan supplemented. So if we have more goblet cells, we should have more mucus. It's also what we see in this trial. This one was done in Japan. And in fact, to stress the birds, the, the, the professor who did this trial applied uh, a, a sort of chronic uh, heat stress. Uh, the birds were kept during 21 days and the birds were um, in fact stressed with heatness from 14 days to 21 days at 35 degrees during seven hours. So it means that this, this had an impact on the expression of the mucin 2. It's a good parameter to measure the production of the mucus which will protect the gut epithelium. And we see that in the control group under heat stress, we have a lower expression of this mucin 2. 
But when we add Safmanan, we see that the expression of this mucin 2 is better. It means that we have a better production of mucus, so it means better physical protection of the gut epithelium. And the gut morphology is also important uh, when we speak about the integrity of the tight junction. When there is a stress, a local inflammation in the gut, we can have an impact on the tight junction, and at the end, we have the separation between the epithelial cells and more lead gut. So, uh, in this trial done by the same professor in Japan, in, fa in fact, he applied an uh, acute heat stress at 14 days, he, he applied uh, uh, 35 degrees at 14 days during uh, two hours, and he measured the, the presence of the, the expression of the, the protein composing this tight, jun this tight junction. So in this case, he uh, uh, focused on the zonula occludin 1 and on the claudine 5. And we see on the left of the graph, without his stress, finally there was no impact of, uh, on the tight junction because there was no heat stress. And uh, finally, Safmanan did not improve the integrity of the tight junction because finally there was nothing to improve. But on the right of the graph, we see that the, uh, um, uh, under a heat stress, we see this impact on the control groups um, on the production of the Z01 and the Claudin 5 due to the heat stress. And then Safnan helped increase the production of this protein, so it helped uh, keep a good uh, integrity of the tight junctions. So then uh, for good gut health, it's important to keep a good microbiota and to control the pathogens. So we did some trials. In this case, it was a trial done in Tur on turkeys, not on broilers, but it was quite interesting to see at the phylum level, so um, uh, it's a very uh, uh, high level in the taxonomy of the bacteria. We see that in the birds which were fed with safmanan on the right at 21 days, the composition of the mi microbiota, we had a higher abundance of the firmicute, which are recognized as beneficial bacteria, including, for instance, Clostridium butyricum producing butyric acid. But on the right, there was a, um, a colonization from a potentially pathogenic bacteria belonging to the proteobacteria. For instance, we have the Salmonella, the E. coli, the Campylobacter, which are included in this film. And we see that we have an early colonization on the control group, and we did not see this early contamination in the Safmanan supplementary group. But then, when we look at the beta, di di beta diversity of the, the microbiota composition, in this trial done in broilers, uh, done in Brazil, so the birds were fed with safmanan, and we see that at 21 days, there was, uh, on the right of the graph, there was a higher beta diversity. So if we consider the, the, the abundance, the richness of the bacteria, and on the other hand, the beta diversity, so in both cases, it was improved by safmanan, so it means we have a better balance of the gut microbiota. And if we focus at some uh, specific bacteria, uh, on the right, we see that, for instance, Ruminococcus torques, E. bacterium aili, Schuttelversia, they were more abundant, it's, and these bacteria are beneficial because they will help to produce some acids, for instance, the, the butyric acid. And we had significantly more of these bacteria on the safmanan supplementary group. And on the other hand, when we look at the Ontario bacteria C, including E. coli or Salmonella, we had a lower colonization of these bacteria in this trial done in Brazil. Then we can focus on Clostridium perfringens. I explained at the beginning that it's an opportunistic bacteria uh, and it can cause some necrotic enteritis and some uh, performance losses. Uh, we, we, um, in fact, we, we try to see, because we know that uh, yeast fraction like safmanan are able to, gra to bind negati uh, gram-negative bacteria like E. coli, salmonella. We know the mode of action. And we were wondering if safmanan could also bind some gram-positive bacteria. Uh, when I say we know the mode of action, because for the gram-negative, it's based on the binding of the, ba the fimbriae which are present on the gram-negative bacteria. The problem is that in gram-positive bacteria, there are uh, very few fimbriae or no fimbriae. So the mechanism has to still to be investigated, but we have some hypotheses, of course. 
but uh, we did several tests, and each time we arrive at the same conclusion. For instance, in this case, in fact, they put in contact safmanan and clostridium. There is uh, then an incubation during four hours, and then they do a filtration, and all the clostridium will, uh, which are not present in the filtrate, in fact, stay bound to safmanan. And in this case, 75% uh, of the clostridium perfusions stayed bound to safmanan in this trial. So, and what happens on the animal? So we did a challenge on the, on the animals. In this case, a challenge with clostridium from day 12 to day 14. And the birds were fed or not with safmanan. And we looked at the composition of the gut uh, for uh, the clostridium. And we saw that there were minus two logs of the clostridium perfungent in the, uh, in the gun content in the safmanan supplementary group, which is an important reduction of the level of the clostridium. Then if we look at the performances in this trial, we saw that there was a better fit conversion. There was also a better average daily gain in the safmanan uh, supplemented group compared to the control group, which was challenged but not supplemented. What is uh, very important also is to control the oxidative stress. When you have a heat stress, a cold stress, a problems of the quality of the raw material in the field, you can have a higher oxidative stress in the gut. So what happened? Uh, yes, first let's speak about uh, the product. In fact, we can prevent this heat stress with cell SAF, which is a natural source of uh, selenocysteine and selenomethionine, the selenocysteine which will be directly involved in the control of the oxidative stress, and the selenomethionine which, will be, which can be stored and then released upon the needs also to be involved later after the transformation in selenocysteine to control the uh, oxidative stress. And what happens when there is uh, oxidative stress? There are some reactive oxygen species which will have an impact on the left on the cell cytosol or on the right on the cell membrane. And there is an involvement of uh, selenoenzymes which help, in fact, recover a good integrity of the cytosol or a good integrity of the cell membrane. And the selenium which, are present, which is present in the cell SAF will be, in fact, uh, incorporating in the selenocysteine in the molecules of, in this case, one of the main uh, uh, selenoenzymes, which is the glutathione peroxidase. And we did some trials to evaluate the benefit of the inclusion of cell SAF, in, uh, in this case on broilers, but we did also this trial on layers also. And the birds which were su uh, su su supplemented with cell SAF um, had a be be higher body weight uh, compared to seleno, uh, to seleno um, sodium selenite and to two other sources of selenometallin. And also the fit conversion was also improved in this case with cell SAF. So it means that uh, upon the stress, so cell SAF can really help the bird to have better performances uh, in challenging conditions. And also what is important, finally, it's also to help the immune system. Uh, we saw also in the first presentation that when there is a um, uh, fast growing, there is an impact on the expression of the immune system. Um, and then we have a product which is called safglucan, which is based on beta-glucan. In fact, in, uh, we saw that in safmanan, there are beta-glucan beta and alpha-manan. In fact, we took out the alpha-manan part and we kept only the beta-glucans in a product which is um, with at least 50% of beta-glucan. And in fact, the beta-glucans are able to interact with some receptors at the surface of immune cells, of the macrophages, of the dendritic cells, uh, the TLR2, TLR6, dectin-1. But the most important for the beta-glucan are the dectin-1. And when the, this dectin-1 is activated, there is uh, some pathway of the, of the immunity which is uh, uh, activated, uh, either Th1, the cell-mediated immunity, or the Th2, the humoral immunity. And depending on the the stress, the, 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 ch the challenge, the infection, in fact, the immune system will react faster and stronger because the beta-glucans uh, train the immune system to react faster and stronger in front of a, an, an infection, but also in front of a vaccination. So we have better vaccine response and better resistance to disease. And in this case, when we have a, a salmonella infection, so in Brazil, we, we challenged the birds with uh, salmonella, and we saw that 
uh, in the birds which were uh, supplemented with beta glucans, with cell glucans. So it was a, a proof of concept trial. The birds were supplemented during all the trials, during all the 42 days. So the, the, the interest was to really see the benefit of the beta glucans to prevent from the colonization of the salmonella in the gut. And we saw that on the left, the, um, the production of secretory IgA against the LPS of the salmonella or the flagella of the salmonella was improved uh, in the saflucan supplemented birds. And on the right, when we look at the, the colonization, colonization of the salmonella in the liver, we see that the salmonella, are the number of the salmonella is reduced at 14 days and 21 days, 28 days uh, in the saf uh, saf supplemented group. So in conclusion, we know that we have more and more withdrawal of antibiotics, both promoters, but also antibiotic for treatment. So it's why the, uh, keeping the good gut health is very important to have a good performances and of course a good income for the farmers. And if we want to keep a good gut health, these products are very good solutions to, for instance, to have to strengthen the epithelial barrier, to stress, to, um, uh, to reduce the, the, the oxidative stress, and also to, um, to reduce the colonization of the pathogen, pathogenic bacteria, to modulate the, the microbiota. So better balance of the microbiota means, of course, a better resilience of the birds to the stress. Uh, reduce oxidative stress, uh, we have to high stress, and the immunomodulation, it's quite important also to help the birds to react faster and stronger to be more resistant to diseases in, uh, on the field. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. There are quite some challenges to the birds' gut health, that's for sure, right? Yes. Uh, I, I already see one question in here in the audience. Uh, microphone is on the way. Thank you. Uh, you said that the use of beta glucans and alpha mannan enhance the increase the number of goblet cells, therefore more mucus. Don't you think that more mucus in the gut favors the anaerobic conditions, which is very good, very uh, suitable for the growth of Clostridium perfringens, for example, which is strictly anaerobic? Thank you. When I say a higher production of mucus, I don't say an excessive production of mucus. We have to differentiate the excessive mucus that we can see when there is a gut inflammation and the better protection of the gut lining with this thicker mucus layer. I didn't uh, show the numbers, but in fact, the, the mucus layer is improved by uh, um, 50 or 100 percent, so it doubled only. Uh, so it means that it would be more difficult for, for the pathogenic bacteria to uh, pass through this mucus and attach to the gut uh, epithel to the epithelial cells. But it doesn't mean that we have an excessive production of mucus and uh, uh, a better uh, environment for opportunistic bacteria, which are mucolytic and which will uh, be uh, will, which will grow in this condition. Uh, it's not the same. So it's not under extreme no. conditions, but yes. field conditions. In fact, it, we increase the protection, but we avoid an all excessive production of mucus. It's a question of dose also, mm -hmm. because we explained that the dose of ours is very important also yeah. for the beta glucan and if we know that the dose of such a uh, uh, product is quite important to respect, because if we double or if we put four times the dose, mm -hmm. we can have a pro-inflammatory effect, mm -hmm. and then uh, we don't have uh, the protection of the, and the, we have the, the contrary that we want to have with such a product. Yeah. Well, when it comes to protection, uh, when you see uh, with the raw material prices at this moment that people, uh, farmers, uh, tend to go to alternative ingredients, could that be harmful to the gut in a certain extent? And would it have an effect on, for instance, antibiotic use? Yes, uh, in fact, of course, uh, it has been also explained uh, in the previous presentations, mm. the choice of the raw material and, and the current situation makes the, uh, the, the Finn millers try alternative raw material. And of course, some of them can increase the stress in the gut, the level of inflammation. Uh, of course, in some cases, it can delay the willing of interrogators to stop post-promoters, perhaps. Mm -hmm. 
but when we explain them and when we do tests by um, adding Safmanan in comparison to group with group promoters, we see that we have the same level of performances. So it means that Safmanan can be a good alternative even in high challenging condition. We, we have some trials, we change the raw material, we add some rye, we add some barley, we try to modify, modify the, the feed formula, and Safranan really helps to reduce the, the impact of this uh, feed uh, formula changing, mm -hmm. keep good growth performances, and also reduce the mortality due to this uh, stress. Mitigating the risks. Yes. Really good. Uh, quick look around the... No? No more questions? Well, Ellen, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, a round of applause for Ellen. Thank, thank you. you. I'm proud to introduce uh, the fourth and last speaker of today. Pushing the button. Uh, and that is uh, Christophe Bostriona. He is head of poultry and swine commercial development team at Christian Hansen. Uh, but you also might know him as the president of the World Poultry Science Association in France, who did a nice conference uh, this summer in Paris. <laughs> but um, today, uh, you will be talking about the power of a robust microbiome and uh, Christophe will show us why a microbiome robustness is important for the health of your business. So Christophe, the audience is yours. Here. Thank you Fabien, Fabien uh, for this very uh, kind word of uh, introduction. <coughs> and uh, I'm gonna uh, use uh, the next 15 minutes uh, to speak around the power of a uh, robust microbiome, which was uh, surfaced by the previous speakers. I'm Christophe Bazirono, I'm uh, heading uh, uh, the poultry and swine uh, uh, commercial development team uh, in Christian Hansen. So first of all, uh, maybe you may know who is uh, Christian Hansen. Christian Hansen is a global microbiome uh, uh, specialist, so the, uh, the provider of good bacteria in the world. So may I ask you a question first, who from, from the audience had uh, for breakfast a chance to eat cheese or yogurt. Okay, quite a lot of people. So indeed, uh, thank you for that because you have, uh, you know that every one cheese over two in the world is made with the good bacteria of Christians. And so thank you for being a uh, uh, Christians and consumers this morning. And I can tell you it's a good thing for you. And for the ones who are online, you can raise back your your hand as well. I mean, as in the audience here. So let's look to uh, the purpose of this uh, call today. <coughs> Why? Uh, first of all, microbiome is important uh, for our birds, for our business, uh, and how uh, the microbiota and micro uh, composition can impact this bird performance, but also the behavior. And finally, we'll see how we can simplify uh, the understanding of microbiome uh, in uh, poultry production. So let's look first to the power of the gut microbiome. And indeed, we have to admit uh, that uh, it's pretty new research, and as you may know, in many times it started all with uh, human research. What you can see here in this slide is how a human microbiome can make mice fat or lean, okay? And from this study, as you can see here, uh, they took two kind of uh, twins, either they were obese twins or lean twins, and they took fecal transplant to make a, a microbiota, and they in inoculate, I would say, uh, to uh, mice. And indeed, the, uh, the microbiota from obese twins get uh, obese and fatty mice, while it was uh, for the lean twins, the, the implantation of this microbiota led to uh, uh, lean mice, and the diet was exactly the same. So, so it means it was one of the very first research 10 years ago uh, to show hmm, something is happening in the gut and in the microbiota. In a more recent research here, you can see three groups of people, and, but let's focus on, uh, on the last one with the green one. Indeed, in this group of people who had also some obesity, they changed both the diet, with different kind of diet, you know, uh, to green uh, Mediterranean diet or Mediterranean diet, which is supposed to be healthier. But also, uh, uh, on the very last one, they, they changed also the drinks. And they've been to healthy drinks as well. So healthy diet, healthy drinks. And all group had some kind of exercise to do every month and and the study lasted six months so guess what after six months most of the obese people they become leaner okay they lost some weight good, good exercise good food good drinks but interestingly after this period of six months 
they, they move to an eight-month period where they say, oh, no, now you can come back to your normal diet, your normal habits. And every day they took uh, either a placebo or they took what we call a, uh, an analogous uh, transplant of their microbiota through, uh, uh, through uh, every day. So basically, they re-inoculate their microbiota with their own probiotics. And guess what? If you look to the very last group, the green one, they were the only group which was able to stay lean uh, compared to the placebo, okay? Uh, and, and this is a, an interesting one because ultimately they look also to the insulin production and you know the rebound effect of insulin when you had have a diet and you see that the ribbon is lower in again the green group here. So this is again one of the proofs that first of all food in general uh, can impact the microbiota, microbiota becomes different after a while and secondly, and this is also the probiotic effect, if we direct this microbiota in a certain way, so we have a probiotic effect when we keep, let's say, uh, uh, seeding the gut with this very favorable microbiota, and we keep the advantage of that. So based on that, uh, there were multiple studies, again, in human. Uh, and what I want to highlight here is one of the examples um, on the link which was proven between the, the gut and the microbiota specifically, and for instance, uh, nervous diseases like Alzheimer, Parkinson, depression, we are far away from the gut, correct? Far away. And indeed, it was proven that there is a link between the gut and the brain. And similarly with allergy, asthma, okay, what's the, the link between gut and lungs? And again, we have proof uh, in human again that there is something happening between these two organs. So here it's, it's a gut health seminar, okay? So, so they, you, you know all that, okay? You know, you know that uh, gut health is a paramount uh, in animal performance, paramount in terms of food safety, also in, in behavior, uh, and of course, at the end of the day, in terms of economics. So let's look to the microbiome where you see uh, the definition here uh, on uh, what we speak about. Uh, and definitely one of the key points is uh, to make the link between microbiota composition and the bird's performance or even behavior. So let's go to some uh, definition first. So what we call microbiome robustness is really uh, the capacity of the intestinal microbiome to be uh, more adapted to any kind of changes. So it's, we can call it uh, more solid microbiota, more resilient microbiota, uh, but at the end of the day, it's its ability to maintain its microbial balance and also its microbial functions and specifically productivity. And we know in poultry specifically, there are many, many challenges. You can name them. Coccidiosis, bacterial enteritis, heat stress, change in diet, etc., etc. You, you name it. Uh, and we know these challenges will happen. So how it will impact microbiota is super important. What we look at, indeed, and again, it's very well uh, uh, mentioned in the literature, is basically three things when we look in terms of robustness of microbiota. First is diversity. Okay, we know and we understand that the more diverse is a microbiota, the better it is. But diverse of, of what? Of a diversity of good bacteria. Okay? Uh, uh, always uh, the image I'm taking is the image of a for forest. Okay? In a forest, what we are looking is for the big and large trees. However, you still have mushrooms and bad herbs you know, uh, in, uh, in the forest. But they are so dominated by the good one, the trees, Competition on sun, competition on soil, competition on water, they cannot, they cannot dominate the forest. So that's a little bit what we look at when we think around diversity. The second point is also uh, from this uh, all bacteria, we looked specifically for the good one. And, and there are bacteria which are able to uh, uh, decrease <coughs> uh, the inflammation. Okay? We call them anti inflammatory mi microorganisms. As a contrary, they are pro inflammatory organisms. So we we'll try also to, uh, to keep the one with a uh, high functionality. And lately, of course, uh, everything which improves the translocation or avoid, let's say, the translocation of bacteria through the gut, it's, it's better because we, we keep, we avoid bacteria to go from the intestinal uh, lumen to the bloodstream. So let's look to uh, one of our uh, research we conducted uh, two years ago. Basically, you know that when we raise chicken, we always uh, arrive with one number, an average. Unfortunately, in reality, amongst this average, we have a diversity of results. So here we take the weight. 
In this research, all chickens were raised exactly the same. They were all male, all same breed, all same feed, same time, same facility, same hygiene, no challenge, everything is the same, okay? They were somehow the same cohort of chicken. And basically, when we looked to the performance, of course, we had an average of uh, uh, 2.5 kilogram, but also we have some extreme birds, what we call the big birds, which are in blue here, and the small birds, which are in pink, pink here. So we looked to these two extreme group of birds, kind of outliers, if you wish. I said, okay, is our microbiota so different between these two? And guess what? What you can see uh, in the top right graph here, it's one of the illustration of what we call alpha diversity, which is how diverse uh, is uh, the microbiota. And remember, the higher is this diversity, the better it is. And basically what we were surprised to see is that the big birds had a higher diversity of microbiota compared to the small birds. Similarly, we look to uh, beta diversity. I will come back to beta diversity later on, which is how common are all these birds together? Do they look like, okay, in terms of microbiota? Or are they completely different besides having a, a very diverse microbiota? And again, guess what? The big birds, they had a more homogeneous microbiota when we compare each with the other one. While the small birds, they had not only a less diverse microbiota, but when we look to uh, the, the microbiota of, um, of this gentleman and, and this gentleman here, we were very different while we were in the same room. That's what happened with these small birds. So we, we continue our investigations <coughs> And again, here we look, okay, so let's look to the second part of the equation we saw initially. Can we influence the microbiota? And of course, we are in the probiotic business. So we say, can we influence microbiota with our probiotic? And from this study, you can see obviously here on the top right of the screen, uh, uh, an image, an illustration of beta diversity as an example. And what we've seen is that with our questions and probiotics, we can change the beta diversity of the treated birds compared to the control group. So definitely we can answer to the second part of the equation that we can modify uh, the microbiota of birds thanks to probiotics. But the next one, if you remember, is okay, but you spoke around the behavior as well. We saw that in humans. So what about the birds? So this is in the, the result of one of our studies, very recent one, where we were able to show that not only probiotics can have an impact on the microbiota composition, but also some to some biomarkers. And we took one here, which is serotonin. Probably you're familiar with serotonin, because this is uh, the molecule of uh, happiness. And 90%, and as a matter of fact, 90% of this molecule is produced in the intestine. Uh, and what you can see, obviously, in this graph on the left here, that when we use our questions and probiotics, we could have higher level of serotonin, in the circulating serotonin in the blood. At the same time, we look to the right here, and there is a, a, a test, we call it approximation test, which is basically the capacity to touch physically a chicken. Okay, so somewhere, it's a way to measure whether this chicken is calmer, is not afraid about human being, you know, and be touched by human being. Uh, and through this test, again, we can see with, uh, by using our questions and probiotics, we were able to have not only higher level of serotonin, but also calmer birds less afraid birds, if you want, less anxious birds. If you want. And then we start to connect the dot between this gut-brain axis we saw previously. What happened in the gut may have an impact in the brain and ultimately to the behavior. It's true in human, probably it's true as well in chicken. So you may say, okay, uh, yeah, you're nice, Mr. Christiansen, with all your, your results and scientific, but what's in it for me? I'm a producer. So okay, same birds. Of course, we were able to prove as well that not only it's good <coughs> for the birds, we change their behavior, etc., but also we have better performance, better weight, FCR, etc. Okay, so not only the microbiota impact and what we can change has an impact <coughs> on the birds, but ultimately for the industry uh, in, in terms of performance. So you may be completely, completely uh, lost with uh, all these concepts. Okay, after the fourth talk. No, you're not? Okay, thank you for your attention then. Uh, uh, and you may say, okay, it's bloody too complex. And this was our challenge to our scientists. 
when we came two years ago to them and say, you know what, I like your story, but it's too complex for our market. So how can we really simplify that? And basically our scientists, they started to scratch their head and what they discovered is, uh, first of all, they realized, yes, microbiota analysis is bloody, bloody too complicated. And you have many, many ways and illustration how we can make it, how can we illustrate it? Taxonomy, alpha diversity, and there is a Shannon index, and curtain Brexit brain uh, uh, index, and beta diversity, and all these things which doesn't help to understand the big picture. But ultimately, through research, they arrive to uh, just one index. They call it robustness index, which is ultimately a simple and easy way to summarize as a gut microbiota in chickens. Uh, and of course, uh, to do that, th they've been to an algorithm with different uh, uh, factors, but also through machine learning, artificial intelligence, literature review to arrive to this concept which is ultimately to come back to what we discussed uh, previously. Okay, how we qualify good bacteria, how we disqualified the, the bad bacteria. Okay, how we take in account the alpha diversity, beta diversity, et cetera, et cetera. And they arrived to this concept to have, okay, one index to explain how robust is the microbiota of our chickens. Ultimately, what does it mean? Well, first of all, for the industry, it means that it will reveal something which is hidden. Okay, uh, reveal a knowledge on something uh, we are not used today to use and an indicator of uh, how we, we manage our poultry operation, but which is super important for the future. Secondly, uh, probably we can avoid losses. If we make a better management of microbiota in our birds, probably we can improve performance at the end of the day and avoid uh, very specifically uh, losses. Uh, and, and lastly, it's definitely to avoid stress. Okay, here we can bring to the equation to our, uh, the poultry industry uh, fact-based decision, and not only gut feeling decision, but specifically in terms of microbiota and microbiome uh, management. So this is what we propose uh, uh, in, uh, in the next uh, months and years to come, to uh, first of all realize that definitely gut health is an important parameter for us, and we keep going on that, but very importantly, microbiome play a key role here, and microbiome robustness is a key role in uh, uh, the whole equation of gut health. And ultimately, we can do microbiome analysis, and very importantly, uh, we need resources, expertise to make it happen, but our pushback uh, is really to simplify that uh, for the, the benefit of uh, the industry. So if you want to know more, uh, we really uh, encourage to go uh, and visit our booth, which is just downstairs uh, in, uh, in the conference center. And if you are online, well, uh, you can, we encourage you to visit our, our website, uh, christiansen.com, uh, Animal Health Part, uh, or to follow up on LinkedIn or Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, interesting. Steering the microbiome in the right direction, starting with yogurt. I'm on board. Okay, thank uh, you. <laughs> and by science and not by gut feeling. I like, I like that as well. Uh, any questions from the audience? Not at this moment. Um, I was wondering, um, is it possible, uh, based on, on the microbiome, to predict um, an outcome in performance, future outcome? Is, is, it, is it feasible? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, uh, Fabian. Thank you for, for asking. And, and, and we must admit, it's, it's a cornerstone in the whole equation. Uh, the short answer is yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, based on, on our research, mm. we show that we, first of all, if the microbiome is more robust, it will be uh, more capable to resist to any kind of attacks, you know, uh, that our, our, our broilers know every day, you know, mm. parasites and bacteria, you name it. <coughs> so that's uh, a prediction in that sense that we know it will be stronger mm. uh, to, to resist to this attack, to be more resilient somehow. Uh, and from our, our research, as we, we saw in the big bird, small bird study, for instance, we, we did see that the microbiome is different between these big birds and small birds, mm -hmm. and ultimately it impacts performance. So I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, in our first presentation, we had slower growing and faster growing broilers. In, in your opinion, would that matter using probiotics? Y using probiotics, you mean? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, 
we, we uh, here we presented, of course, uh, uh, studies mainly on uh, on chicken. Uh, we are also doing in in layers. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in some cases in yeah. small, uh, let's say, uh, slow growing birds and yeah. uh, and uh, let's say medium, etc. Uh, we we do believe there are differences mm -hmm. uh, between between them. Uh, where it comes from, probably we, we need to ask the genetic company, but we do believe there are differences in it. Uh, however, when we look to uh, probiotic use, especially, uh, from, from where we are today, we do see an impact either in layers, slow growing, or, or large growing. Uh, I, I think we are beyond uh, the species in terms of effectiveness. Exactly, yeah. Over cross species, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was wondering a little bit, what, what would come first? Is it, is it the loss of robustness of the microbiome or is it, is it the disease itself? Is there disease pressure first and then loss of microbiome or the other way around? Yeah, again, uh, it's a very good question uh, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of chicken and egg question, <laughs> you know, okay? And, uh, and of course- I like both. So no. Yeah, and you know who was before chicken and egg? No, it was a dinosaur. Uh, that, yes. That, uh, <laughs> They are all descendants from dinosaurs. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, uh, we do believe that uh, uh, microbiome robustness, if it is achieved and made great first, mm -hmm. uh, will help the birds to be more resilient, more stronger against any kind of uh, attack. Okay. So, so uh, I think the, the foundation is really to keep this microbiome uh, uh, robust, mm -hmm. okay, with an abundance of good bacteria, of and to keep the functionality of the microbiome. And that's what it needs to start yeah. with. And then diseases have, have no chance. Well, they may have Less some chance, chance, but it would be harder uh, for a bacteria or change in diet. Mm -hmm. It's not only yeah. disease. Yeah. I would change diet every seven, ten days in chicken. Mm -hmm. So even a change of diet, even if it is a subtle one, uh, to, to modify this more microbiome, uh, because it would be more robust. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Christoph. You're welcome. Well, that brings us to the closing part already of this seminar. And of course, we heard a lot about uh, the importance of gut health. Uh, and we were also handed some great tools and knowledge uh, to keep our birds healthy with the right management and nutritional intervention, even in the most challenging uh, conditions. So I want to thank all of today's speakers uh, for their great contributions. Uh, so your round of applause for Ellen van Eeren, uh, Leon Marshall, uh, Alain Régy, and of course, Christophe Bostivillon. <laughs> Thanks. I hope that you all enjoyed uh, this session. Uh, and well, uh, I wish you all the luck with the weather. I'm just looking outside at, uh, at your tier. It's not that good today. But thank you for being here as a guest uh, of Poultry World. Uh, keep us following on our website, poultryworld.net. Uh, and of course via our socials. And when you leave this uh, room, there will be a goodie bag for you, uh, courtesy of us and, and the sponsors. Thank you very much.